So I'm Myosha McAfee. I've been at Google for about 10 months, 10 and a half. Maybe I'm at that 11th mark. I'm not sure yet. Um, and I'm the principal racial equitect. Yes, I made that title up. I love Google because I get to make up my titles. Um, and that essentially means I'm, I'm trained as a social scientist, race scholar, and I am responsible for figuring out how do we grapple with race and its intersections as a company. And really thinking about what does that look like in the workplace, in a corporation, even though it's Googly type of corporation. Um, and I'm very excited to be a part of Decoding Race. <clears throat> This is the seventh and a 12th part series. Um, and we wanted to center on intersectionality today. Talk about more, being more than a woman, the intersections of race, gender, and sexual orientation. Um, and so I wanna first welcome our guests here, distinguished guests, and thank you, Austin, for having us here. First up, we have television and fashion personality, E.J. Johnson. Let's give him a warm round of welcome. <laughs> Next to EJ is Tanzina Vega. Tanzina is a national reporter for CNN Money, where she covers issues of race and inequality in America. Prior to working at CNN, Vega was a self-reporter, staff reporter for the New York Times, where she created a beat. She created a beat covering issues of race and ethnicity for the National Desk. And it's important to note, she created a beat. <laughs> Next to Tanzina is Dr. Kim Crenshaw. Woo! He's a professor of law at UCLA and Columbia Law School and a leading scholar in civil rights, black feminism, and the law. She actually coined two terms that have become essential in our conversations about race and its intersections. Critical race theory, if you've ever heard of it, and intersectionality. If you're using those words, she created those words. Let's give it up for Dr. Crenshaw. And next to her is Linda Sarsour, is a Palestinian-American Muslim scholar, activist, and media commentator. She is the executive director of the Arab American Association of New York, co-founder of the first Muslim online organizing platform, Empower Change, and the co-chair and organizer of the Women's March in DC. So we have some serious, serious people up front. We want to get real honest, real raw. We want to speak our truths, and we're hoping that you can bear witness to the space, find your own story in it, and if not, just hold space for somebody else's um, reality here. First up, we're going to just start with a big old word, intersectionality, and just break it down. So we're going to start out with, with Cam just breaking it down for us, because the, the, this form was born out of the late essayist Audre Lorde's, there is no thing, no such thing as a single issue struggle, because we do not live single issue lives. It centers intersectionality, and it's an idea you introduced and developed, so let's begin with a simple breakdown of what is in intersectionality, how do you define it, why should we be talking about it? All right, so I, I'll give the, the uh, elevator version. Mm -hmm. Um, and offer some illustrations. The elevator version basically is this. Intersectionality reflects the reality that systems of subordination, power, discrimination, like racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, are not separate and distinct forms of discrimination. Many times they overlap, they interlock, they create kinds of problems and challenges that can't be addressed if you think of these issues as just single issues. So it's the simple fact that if you dis experience race discrimination as a woman, you're probably experiencing both race and gender discrimination. Um, and so the, 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 the simple version is just recognizing that there are multiple forms of discrimination. Some people are subject to more than one of them. And if your tools that you have to identify and intervene do not focus on the intersections, you're probably not doing much to alleviate the problem. Now that's the elevator version. Um, here's a more, I guess, um, uh, narrative version. Um, intersectionality was basically a term that I used to try to explain a problem. Um, it was a problem in a workforce. It was a problem with black women who were basically saying that in the industry that they were in, it was an auto manufacturing industry, that they were being discriminated against. They couldn't get hired. Um, the problem was that the courts had a version of what race discrimination looked like, and it was what happened to black men. 
and they had a version of what gender discrimination looked like, and it was what happened to white women. These black women were saying, well, what happens to white women and what happens to black men doesn't really tell you much about what's happening to us. Yes. So white women, yes, they are experiencing a form of discrimination here. They can't work in any other place in this industry but as a secretary or a receptionist or a telephone operator. The way they experience gender discrimination isn't exactly the same way that we're experiencing gender discrimination. They have to work as, as secretaries. We can't work at all. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say African American men are experiencing discrimination. When they apply here at this auto manufacturing plant, they're only allowed to work in the front, uh, on the floor, in the heavy jobs, in the dangerous jobs. That's discrimination. But their discrimination is not the same as ours because as women, we can't even get that work. Mm -hmm. So the point of intersectionality was to say, we can figure this out if we just use a real common metaphor, an intersection. So some part of the way that workforce was structured, the roads, was a racial structure. Black jobs are here, white jobs are here. The other part of the structure was a gender structure. Women can work here, women cannot work here. If you are a black person who's a woman, you are actually situated where those two policies come together. So the traffic, the policy, the hiring decisions that go down the race road or the gender road actually creates an intersection where those people who are black and female are subject to discrimination. So it's not really a complicated idea, um, but it is one that requires people to understand that intersectionality is not just about identity. It's about identity in a context in which your identity makes a difference in your access to equality or your availability to discrimination. All right, so we're gonna drill down a little bit more to talk about this because we wanna move into our lived experience, not just in the words that are kind of float up here, 50,000 feet high level abstract. So I'm gonna start out with you, Linda, just talking about how do you actually, how, do you, how are you living your intersectional life? What are, what are points, what are contexts where you experience advantages in the context where you're experiencing disadvantages? Uh, thank you so much for um, having me here today. Um, I came here from Brooklyn, New York, so I bring a lot, no, I was kidding. Um, <laughs> I think to Dr. Crenshaw's point and Audre Lorde, I mean, it's just, it's uh, so simple, but yet so profound. You know, I'm Palestinian. Mm -hmm. I come from a heritage and a lineage of people living under military occupation. My parents came here to live a better life. I'm a woman. I'm a woman of color. I'm an activist, a political activist. Um, I'm a parent. I'm a young mom. Had my first kid when I was 17 years old. So I bring a lot to the table. Um, and I want to be treated as a whole person. And my lived experience as someone who's a Muslim woman is that there have pe been people who just the minute they see me, they have already preconceived what my story is and how I got to where I got to. And I think that, you know, and I'll give you an example of what, what intersectionality, how it actually plays out. Because again, it's not complicated, but it requires work. So. I was one of the co-chairs of the Women's March on Washington, and originally it started as the women's rights are human rights, right? And it was a, started the first three days by well-intentioned white women who were like, women's rights are human rights and reproductive rights and Planned Parenthood and all this stuff. And when women of color came to the table, we were like, hold on a second here. No. We can't go to the table as women and talk about reproductive rights and leave out every other issue that needs to be brought to the table because as, a, as, a, as a, 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 an Arab American Muslim woman, um, a Chicana Mexican woman, Carmen Perez, and to me, we were like, no, no. You can't talk about women's reproductive rights without talking about race and class and access. You can't talk about, you know, uh, you can't talk about women's reproductive uh, rights without talking about race, uh, or, I mean, about racial justice and criminal justice and if we win justice and we don't have a planet to live on, like it just all kind of intersects. So it was a very, people thought it was great and you got to the march and it was like, oh, so inspiring. But in fact, the process getting there was not that inspiring often mm -hmm. because it required us being able to say that we are whole people and we come from mixed, I come from a mixed status family. I have people in my family who are undocumented. I got to talk about them too. 
I come from the racial justice movement and I want to talk, I want to say her name. You know, I want to I want to be able to say Black Lives Matter on the stage and being able to teach people that we have enough of a big heart and enough of intellect for me to be able to say Black Lives Matter, justice for immigrants, justice for LGBTQI people, religious freedom, whatever, all together. Like we could do that. And that's for me what intersectionality is at play, that we welcome people with all their complexities to the table. We don't allow people to leave any part of them out because it does it's not convenient for the work or the movement or for, quote, social justice, that everyone comes to the table with everything. And if you don't accept all of me as an intersectional human being, then that's not the space that I want to be in. Thank you. We want to keep it personal, local, and immediate. Tanzina, you want to step in? Talk about how you're living an intersectional life. Um, so my intersectionality, I guess, would be described as I'm a Puerto Rican woman, um, Latina, but specifically Puerto Rican, I think. And I say that because the conversations around Latinos today, I think, are very narrow in the way we look at it. Everybody's an immigrant. Everybody's a Mexican. Everybody just got here. It's not, that's not the case. In many cases, it is, and I have the numbers if you want to dig deeper into that. But, um, but I'd like to also showcase that there are different types of Latinidad, is what we call it. Um, and so by definition, that makes me racially a very mixed and diverse person. Um, there are black people in my family. There are people who have uh, Taino blood, which is the, uh, the Indians who were in, on the island of Puerto Rico. And obviously, there's white European blood there as well. Um, which is why I, I am sort of ambiguously ethnic to a lot of people. When they see me, they know I'm not white. But they don't know they don't, I'm not black. They're sort of actually. I had a student in South Korea once say to me when I was teaching ESL there, um, said, "Teacher, you're not white. You're not black. What are you?" And I was like, "That's another two hours that we get to kill." <laughs> um, but it was a poignant question. I mean, we're in this tiny town in South Korea. This was in 2002, um, and so they didn't have a lot of exposure to anything other than mainstream media. And mainstream media, someone that works in the mainstream media now, that wasn't always the path that I thought I was going to be on. And the images that we get of who we are from mainstream media, for me growing up as a Latina, as a Puerto Rican woman, but also as a working class and poor family. I lived in public housing for the first 20, 21 years of my life. So right there, if I say, I grew up in the projects, Think about what's in your mind right now, what you're imagining. If I, if I hadn't said that and I just sat here and said New York Times, CNN, traveled the world, talked in South Korea, like your image of me is very different probably than what you have in your mind right now if I say I spent 21 years in the projects, right? Now it's like, ooh, okay, that's a, that's a change, right? But that's a core identity, that's a core part of who I am, that also in the conversations around intersectionality, we often forget about class. I think class is one of the most underrepresented parts of the conversation and an area that so many of us can connect on when we, and, and we tend to not do that. Um, and I say, and of course I'm a woman, um, I'm a heterosexual woman, so that presents its own set of um, you know, challenges in many cases. And I'm a woman of, of a certain age. I won't say where, but you know, <laughs> probably a little older than a couple of you. Um, and so all of these things are connected. None of these things, but yet growing up, there was never really a space for people like me. And when Kim and I were talking, you know, before we got here, I said one of my goals is to really start to create more spaces where, oops, sorry, there's my water, where people, um, where people who are living these sorts of intersectional lives can come together, where you see yourself reflected. Um, so I said, I grew up in the projects, right? Everybody probably has an image of what that looks like, right? Well, guess what? There are also people in the projects who work every day and raise families and aren't, you know, drug addicted or any other thing, but there are lots of pathologies that also happen in public housing. So being able to survive that was one thing, but being able to also not get involved in that lifestyle, you didn't really feel like I fit there, but it didn't necessarily fit in certain other areas. And when it came to being a feminist, um, which I define myself as, that was also something that was like, whoa, this is a really white conversation, right? That really tends to be led by white, wealthy, or women of means, educated white women of means. So while I believed in a lot of the tenants, I felt like that conversation was very limited, and it did not, in, it did not embrace the totality of who I am as a person, of what I have to deal with as a woman of color, of what I have to deal with as a woman who came from a working class background. And so there are so many of the, and believe me, tra I traveled the world for four years on my own. There weren't a lot of people that looked like me out there. This whole backpacking thing, that was a very like white thing to do back in the day, right? And I was like, what do you, what? Like, you don't even know anybody in China? Nope. 
but I'm out, you know? And then even being in China was like, what? Like, you're not blonde? You know, people just didn't get it. And I mean, it was an amazing experience, but it also shows the limitations to how we as Americans define who we are and really take into account the different layers that each of us has. And all of those things, how am I living my intersectionality? Well, I'm living it by doing it. Um, I, if any of you follow me on Twitter, I'm very vocal about issues of diversity, particularly in the industry that I work in, which is media. Um, but I also created you know, content around this issue. And whether it's media representation or inequality, that's my contribution to it. But it comes from a place of real experience and personal and lived experience. So I hope that answered yeah. your question. Yeah. It's your story. You tell and it. I'm I'm like, tell it. And I could right, go EJ, on. Even a personal local immediate. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I will say that um, my personal experience is just a lot of ups and downs, a lot of, you know, almost contradictions, really. Um, you know, I am a black male. I'm part of the LGBTQ community as well. Um, but also, you know, I had to learn about, you know, I had my struggles you know, we're different from, you know, a lot of other people's growing up. Like, not only do I have to deal with black male, but now, oh my God, I'm gay, what do I do? So, it was just, and at the same time, you know, I came from a, you know, from a, a privileged family, so I didn't necessarily have to deal with, you know, the race card, like, the first thing on the table. But, you know, it's something that my parents always taught me, like, you know, this is what our people went through, this is what, you know, you may face one day, and, you know, eventually I had to see that for myself. And then, you know, go growing up and then finding out, holy crap, like, I'm different again. Here I am being gay and gender fluid. So now what do I do? So that was a whole other experience for me. And, um, you know, just because, you know, someone might look at me and just be like, oh, well, look at this queen go. You know, you have it all. <laughs> or you're wearing fancy clothes and doing this and that. But I, you know, I have my own struggles. And I think that that's, you know, what the great thing about this intersectionality thing is, is just that, you know, we are all part of, we all have our, we are part of all so many different communities and they come together, you know, in ways that might be daunting and but at the same time are also, you know, beautiful. But I think that the thing is like, it's so hard to not put people in boxes and, and, and just look at one struggle or one thing that somebody else is doing. You have to look at everything. And, and a lot of the times that person has to tell you and you have to just really, you know, listen to them and, and listen to their stories and listen to their struggles to understand what's, what's going on in their mind, what's going on in their life. And, you know, that's really where I think that we are getting rid of that kind of discrimination where we're really listening to and looking at all the different sections that, you know, that person is in. And, you know, for me personally, it was just, it was a, it was just a lot of ups and downs for me. Like, I thought, you know, okay, like, I don't really have, I'm not really dealing with this race thing, but now people are staring at me because of the way I dress. People are staring at me because I'm holding hands with some other boy. People are, you know, making comments and snickering to me and attacking me on social media. And, um, you know, it's just, there was just so much pressure, and especially after I had a, a, pub, a public coming out, which, you know, most people don't have to deal with, that's really when, you know, the red flags raised for me that, um, you know, I have to be here, I have to stand my ground because not everyone's gonna have my back. And, you know, I tried not to read a lot of the things that people wrote about me or said, but at the same thing, at the same time, it cannot be ignored. And of course, it stemmed from a lot of ignorance and a lot of hate, but, um, you know, I just had to stay, you know, stay true to who I was. I, I wasn't changing. I, I'm never going to not be me just because some, you know, sad woman in her basement wants to come for me. <laughs> but the point is, you know, um, it was, it was, it, it's, it was a lot to deal with at the time because I was still, you know, relatively young. And at the same time, you know, I just had to, underst I had to understand where, you know, th that type of ignorance was coming from and, and that for the time being, it's not going to change. And people can be nice to your face and people can, you know, give you hugs and be like, oh, yes, 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 but you don't really know what they're going home and saying about you or what they're doing. And you have to, you know, really do that extra work to make sure that those people know that you know they can't break you down, and also to you bring your all your communities together and uplift that type of hatred, because mm -hmm. that's where that's where we're kind of moving, but we need to keep that momentum going because it's, it's going to be extremely important, you know, for the future. Thank you. So now I want to go back to the organizing of this of the women's march, and you were like, 
At the end, it was some glory, but on the way there, there were some challenges. And I think when we're trying to figure out, like, how do we design solutions, or how do like I as an individual, I as a team, begin to actually apply intersectional frameworks? And one thing that I think is a common practice that we grapple with here is as soon as we start centering marginalized communities, whether that's black folks or queer folks or poor folks, people of the more privileged class start looking for the side of their identity that has disadvantage. And like, well, what about this? Why mm -hmm. can't this be at the center? So I'll give one example. We want to talk about race. There are people like, let's talk about gender. And it's a constant, like, let's make this a single issue. Let's put them in competition with each other. And so I'm curious about what did it mean to have a march that started out with white women's organizers? And I know there's an incredible amount of conversation about where are the women of color, should women of color even attend this event? But once you guys just, once you all decided to come on board, what was the conversation? Like, how did the agenda have to shift? How did certain practices have to shift? What did white women in particular, what new role did they have to take on? What new frameworks did they have to walk in? And then women of color, what was their difference that they had to engage with? So when the Women's March on Washington was originally announced, it was the Million Women's March, and we were like, <laughs> educational moment. There was already a Million Women's March. You know, and I will say this, and just a little credit to the, the, those particular white women is that they, they really didn't know. They had no idea uh, that that was. So they changed the name. We went to the Women's March on Washington with the blessings of um, Bernice King, who's Dr. Martin Luther King's daughters. There was always conversations that were happening even when we took on that name. But, and the skepticism that was coming from women of color was welcomed because we were the skeptical women of color too that ended up being part of the march. But I will say this, we were not about to allow white women to have a national or march where they were gonna set the agenda for women nationally and not have women of color as part of the conversation. Like we were just not gonna let that happen. So we took one for the team. <laughs> and what happened during the organizing of the march was that we had, so I remember a New York Times reporter who wrote a story about this where she was basically trolling the Women's March on Washington Facebook page and she saw a lot of divisive, like tense, tense conversations that were happening about why we were talking about race and why we were kind of pushing this conversation. And she asked this question and she said, you know, um, do you think this is gonna hurt the march? You know, who's doing your social media and whatever? And I was like, hold up. This is not an accident. This, these conversations that we're creating about race are by design. Like we were pushing those conversations forward the way our social media was talking about the issues in an intersectional manner was designed that way. And was it, was it because we wanted to create divisiveness? That divisiveness had nothing to do with us. It had to do with the people who were feeling like there was some sort of, you know, they were offended by something that they themselves hadn't grappled with, you know, as mm -hmm. mostly white women. So if I'm talking to you about you want to talk about pay equity, but you don't want me to say you may be a white woman not getting the pay, same the paid as a man, but black and Latino and other women of color are not getting paid the same amount as you, and you don't want me to talk about that, then you ain't really in this for me. And if you are too, if, if offended enough that you don't want to come to the march, I think that march is going to be just fine without you. <laughs> and then the other conversation that came up that was really interesting in the way that we think about, you know, are we in this together, was a, a lot of controversy around this idea why we didn't, like, highlight Hillary Clinton. Like, why wasn't Hillary Clinton like our poster child for the Women's March on Washington? Clearly, I got 20 reasons why, personally, why she wasn't my poster child, but I'll leave that to the side. But this idea that people actually thought that we would take a privileged, multi-millionaire, rich white lady that has a dynasty to be the face of the Women's March on, are you out of your mind, is my personal response to that. But it was really a, 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 a lot of, opportunities to have what Carmen Perez calls courageous conversations. This is the reason why we preach to the choir, because we only want to talk to people that only agree with what we have to say. And I say to women of color, and many of them are people that I only mostly organize with women of color, is that I get it, I'm with you. Pain, trauma, we're tired of having to explain to white people why they gotta be in it in the way that we want to. But we are at a moment right now in this country, we're all in this together. We're living under fascism right now. And in order for us to defeat fascism, or at least survive under fascism, we gotta be in this together. So being able to take a little extra time to be like, okay, what about this? What about this? Read this. Did you ever read this book? Did you read Dr. Kimberly's book? Did you read this? And being able to, and for people to actually say, I will. 
And that's the people that we were working with, people who genuinely just never organize a day in their lives. Like, for example, Bob Bland, one of the, one of the core, four national co-chairs, is a fashion entrepreneur. That's what she does for a living. She don't really need to be an activist, although I realized that she was in her own way. She does ethical manufacturing, right? So she, her job is she incubates uh, fashion lines ethically and within the United States of America. So I was like, do you know that that's a form of activism? So in fact, there are women who had different things that they cared about they, that they were able to bring. One of them is uh, a woman by the name of Brianne Butler. Brianne Butler was a baker. She bakes cakes for a living. Like, the Women's March was also an opportunity to bring ordinary people that are not activists and in organizing spaces and bringing them to the table and saying, what talents do you have? What do you care about? How can we use you to put this forth? But, but at the end of the day, what we were able to do with the Women's March on Washington and inspired by longtime work by people like Dr. Kimberly is that it was an intersectional march that was led by women. It wasn't a women's march because there were men that were there and it was also an opportunity for us to center climate justice, racial justice. There were plenty of black women on the stage and I didn't say this earlier about myself. So I'm a Palestinian Muslim American. I'm an Arab American. I'm white if you want to be technical according to the US Census Bureau, right? So I have light skin. If I took this hijab off, I'd be like any other white lady in this room. Darker hair, but I do got, but I am white. I mean, race-wise. So I chose as one of the co-chairs to center black Muslim women in the march, right? So for example, you saw Alia Sharif, she's a hip hop artist from, uh, from Oakland. We had Muhammad Ali's daughter. We had Sister Aisha Prime from Baltimore. Like, I chose to use my own privilege as a light-skinned Muslim who may not have privilege in the outside general you know, society, but within my own community, let's be real, I do get more platforms than black Muslim women do in my community. So I chose at that moment to be able to say, okay, who am I centering for my community here? I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna center black Muslim women voices. And at the Women's March, being able to center trans voices and, and center uh, you know, women of color who are actually doing work that, that is not necessarily connected to being per se a woman of color. So for example, you know, uh, the president of NRDC, which is the National Resource Defense Council, is a black woman. And her, she has dedicated her life to climate justice, for example. So being able to also take people and show people that I don't have to be a Muslim woman that works on Muslim issues. I could be a Muslim woman running a reproductive rights organization. I could be a Muslim woman running a climate justice organization. So we did that. And we were able to center those voices. And we were also able to show people like for example, like we had no shame saying to someone like Scarlett Johansson, you went over your time and you're getting your mic cut. Like you don't get more time than you don't get more time than the undocumented Pakistani girl from Staten Island. The idea that we were able to say, who? You, yes. You, and by the way, FYI, you probably don't know this. We didn't invite those celebrities. Just so you know, those were people that came to us and wanted to get down with what we were doing, right? So we didn't have to go out and reach out. The people we recruited were the actual activist organizers and directly impacted people that were at the march. So my point is, is that the Women's March on Washington wasn't all glory. There were tense moments. There were moments where, believe it or not, we were in tense conversations where I remember clearly where one woman said, a white woman said, I'm feeling, quote, get ready for this one, I'm feeling like a second class citizen. <laughs> Excuse me? Do you even understand for you to be able to say what it means to be a second? You, I'm being marginalized in this space. Excuse me? So being able to also allow people to think and reflect on the type of language that they use with people that actually do fundamentally understand marginalization. People who fundamentally understand what it means to be a second class citizen. Not to say that women historically haven't, white women included, haven't felt like in certain spaces as second class citizens, but to be in a space with women of color who have had loved ones, in our group, loved ones die to gun violence, police violence, people who's, uh, Carmen Perez's sister, like people who have been around gang activity that has directly impacted their family, people who understand state violence like in a very deep way, have not gotten jobs because of their race or, or other reasons. For, for them to hear that, it was triggering. People were triggered. And so there was a lot of you know, hard moments, but what we ended up manifesting at the Women's March on Washington, and this wasn't successful everywhere. There were some states where some of the people of color were like, nah, mm -hmm. we, we ain't. And we weren't responsible for that because it was a decentralized method of organizing where there were people who individually took the branding of the Women's March on Washington and made it their own. We saw that as a first step. But we had to talk. We did this in an intersectional way. We made sure that the agenda not only gave women of color seats at the table, but that the women of color were on the table. Like, if you weren't talking about us 
and we weren't the center of the conversation as the most directly impacted in this current environment, we didn't want anything to do with that. But also being able to see the power of centering women of color, not just their issues, but them as leaders. So when we came to the Women's March on Washington, we were, I was like, look, you ain't putting my cute face as a token Muslim. Like, that's just not happening. I want to be a boss here, and I want to have a leadership role. What do you want to do? I want to fundraise. I think that I'm good at that. They were like, you want to fundraise? Yes, I want to fundraise. And the reason why I wanted to fundraise also is because I wanted to teach people about being able to organize a movement that is powered by the people, which is not a concept also people often understand. They always think we need to have Walmart in the back. Or even, to be honest, even Google, right? Even if you're corp like Patagonia, there's some companies that you may see and say they're corporate, you know, responsible, they're, they're whatever, you, I mean, you know what I'm saying. And I said, guess what, we could do this without corporations. I will not stand on a stage that has Coca-Cola or Pepsi or any corporation behind me. And, 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 and white folks in particular were really like, I don't think you're gonna be able to do that. And we did it. The, the Women's March on Washington was funded by the people, by the $27, the $50, the $20, the $10, and it was also by the partners, Plan, Planned Parenthood, MoveOn.org, ACLU, and those type of folks that came in and gave us that money. So being able to have these hard conversations, being able to be women of color and say we will only work under these circumstances, and being heard, and that's why I want to give the white women that we worked with credit, because they could have been like, nah, this is our, we started this, that's not how we right. envisioned it. Right. So y'all need to step out. We'll go find some other white, uh, other mm -hmm. women of color mm -hmm. who, who aren't going to be like y'all and, and make right. us do whatever we wanted. And they were like, no, maybe we're going to learn something from you. And maybe we are going to yeah. do intersectional. And that's what happened at the Women's March. So I want to all that to say that I give credit to those white women who listened. We actually said this to them. Can you just listen for a second? So Tamika Mallory, who many of you may know, is a quite a, you know, she got a little spice in her. You know, she's from the Bronx. Like, she's no joke. Like, she puts it out there, you take it or leave it. And one day she said, do you know my story? And when she shares that her son's father was shot and killed when her son was only two years old, found in a ditch two weeks after he was dead, and she had to witness that, right? And her son's growing up without his father, living in a, in poor, in a poor community in the Bronx, right? And growing up in a civil rights community and family and has seen people in her family arrested, incarcerated, like told these very personal stories about her family. Then the women were like, because you will never experience what Tamika matters. So don't ask her why she's angry all the time. She got reason to be angry. And when Carmen tells you that her sister was buried on her 17th birthday, so when it was Carmen's 17th birthday, her sister, who's only two years older, was buried on her birthday in Oxnard, California. She grew up in a community that was ranguished with you know, gang violence and poverty. And when you hear their stories, it makes you sit back and say, whoa, whoa. I'm never going to experience what these ladies saw. You know what? I got something to learn from them. So all it required was for women to sit back, not be defensive, and learn and listen. And that's how we got to January 21st, which was the l up until today, and I hope folks want to do bigger than that, it is the largest protest in U.S. history, and it happened wow. this year in your generation at our watch, on our watch, and I hope that we continue to do that work. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to go to, to Dr. Kim next, um, asking the question around how do we be intentional about being intersectional? And I want to build on what um, Linda just laid out. And if you, if you missed it, I just want to hit you with the bullet points, because I know at Google, we like to hit me with the bullet point. Um, women of color, I think what she laid out is being willing to ask tough cash questions to people in the dominant group, being willing to educate, but not like necessarily yourself. Here's some books if you want to read it, right? So you don't sit yourself in this racial battle fatigue. Um, you're assertive at the negotiation table. She's very clear, look, you're not going to use me as a token. <laughs> You're not gonna put my, my face up there. We're not gonna have Coca-Cola in the background. Like very assertive in, in setting parameters and boundaries around how are we gonna do this rather than being at the effect of the experience there. Um, using the privilege she does have. And I think that's really important to acknowledge when you're a person of color. Like we're all walking around with these identities of both privilege and disadvantage. So she's naming as a lighter skinned Muslim woman, like what, what privilege do I have here that I can center somebody else's experience? So thinking about that as a black woman, are there people amongst that community that I need to be centering because I'm privileged in a certain way? I am highly educated at an elite Ivy League university. There's definitely room for me to make space for other women, other lived experiences, other frameworks. Um, and then equalizing despite status. So. She, what was the, the famous person, I forgot her name. 
the, the was it something Scarlett Johansson? Johansson. Yeah. yeah, Scarlett Johansson is like, you don't get mo more talk time than an undocumented immigrant, <laughs> right? So I mean, I mean, even thinking about equalizing on, on that level, and I think for white women in particular, humility, I think, came up a lot. A willingness to learn came up and a willingness to follow. Mm -hmm. Like, regardless of your title, your position, you fall back. Somebody else in the marginalized community has certain experiences, which does create a certain amount of knowledge that informs what we should do next. That's the high level bullet point. Dr. Kim, we're gonna add to that list of how do we be intentional, <laughs> add to the list, how do we be intentional about being intersectional? There's a lot of people who are trying to figure out what do I do next. Yeah. Yeah, and, and th those are all, um, I think, absolutely essential um, steps to take. I think what I would add to it is um, an understanding that the challenge is to multiple communities, not, not just the white women. So the march was a context mm -hmm. in which the conversation was about mm -hmm. um, deprivileging and shifting the frame to broaden it. But it's also the case that that's a conversation that needs to be had within institutions. Mm -hmm. um, it's a conversation that has to be had within racial justice struggles. Mm -hmm. um, it's a conversation that has to be had within LGBTQ struggles. Mm -hmm. So in each of these spaces, the same kind of moves often have to be made in order to make sure that the intersectional ways that certain kinds of experiences um, play out are, are actually um, at, at the center of the movement. This, this um, conversation started with um, a video clip f um, from our organization on a campaign called Say Her Name. And um, Say Her Name actually came out of a march. We were in a march in New York City um, around the non-indictment of the officer responsible for killing Eric Gardner. Um, there were thousands and thousands of people there who had been drawn because of that inju injustice. And in the process of marching, we were calling out men who had been killed by the police, and there was a whole spate of them, as many of you know, Michael Brown, uh, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray. Um, we started naming some of the women who had been killed at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Cousseau was, was killed within two weeks um, of, of my of Mike Brown and, and, and no one knew her name. Ara Russer, uh, Tanisha Anderson was killed a week before Tamir Rice by the same police department. No one knew, knew her name. So s some part of say her name um, is to build on the frame that already exists. So we know that state sanctioned violence has been racialized throughout the history of this country. We have images, we have frames, we have quick ways of thinking about it. A lot of people think in terms of lynching, they think in terms of um, the ways that police have contributed to that, but they think of that in a gender exclusive way. Mm -hmm. So our challenge was to take that frame and broaden it, to say everything you think you know about stake sanction violence, yes, that's true, and also this, mm -hmm. and also this. So in the same ways that um, police have often said that like Mike Brown was like a monster he was framed as, someone who uh, had to be put down with a gun because he couldn't be stopped. Actually, police say the same thing about black women who are killed. And when it's said about a woman, it's clear that it's a, it's a racial thing that's happening. There's no way that um, a, a, a woman um, could be um, overtaken and, and, and tasered to death by uh, seven different men um, as, as happened in one of the cases that we highlight, tasered to death because they said she posed a risk to their lives. This is something that's real, it's something that happened, um, it is a real risk that black women face. So we try to build intersectional awareness based on the single issue ideas that people have. If you think this is what state sanctioned violence looks like from a racial justice point of view, this is what happens when you add gender to it. And it's the same on the other side. Um, there is a significant movement around gender-based violence. Rape and sexual abuse is something that women have organized around um, for, for at least 50 years. You don't get women's organizations organizing around rape and sexual abuse of pol by police officers, right? Mm -hmm. But just last year, a police officer um, in Oklahoma was convicted for raping and abusing eight black women. What made it possible for him to rape and abuse eight black women? It's 
intersectional vulnerability. They're black women, historically black women have not been believed. They were poor women. Many of them were uh, system involved women, meaning they had a criminal record. These were all things that made this officer believe that he could do what he could do with impunity and nothing was gonna happen. So that's the intersectional vulnerability. The problem is neither the gender-based violence movement nor, quite honestly, the anti-racist movement against police violence took that case up. Why is that? It fell between the cracks. It fell between the way that you think about race-based violence. It's shooting, it's beating, it's not raping. And it fell between the way people think about violence against women. That's usually seen as private, not as something that the state is responsible for. So the, the basic message is, if we want to think how to deepen our practice, we have to ask concrete questions. This is the way gender is imagined to be a, um, a factor in a, a workplace. Is it the only way? Are there other ways that we can think about it? Or to flip the script, yes, I'm subject to gender, but what advantages do I have that I'm allowed to use in order to na navigate this space that another woman who's not white has? I like to sometimes think about it as the difference between are you, can, he, can the boss imagine you in his living room? Or can he imagine you in the locker room? So if you're a man of color, you do have that racial disadvantage, but you do have shared masculinity. And sometimes you can navigate your disadvantage with that. Or if you're a white woman, yes, gender might be a factor, but you do have social similarity. You do have a common social cultural history that you might be able to use. But that woman of color has neither of those things. And if you, if you really want to have some proof of it, look at some of the studies on mentoring. Mentorship, everyone knows, is one of the most significant things that you can have to help you navigate upward. Mentors are most likely to share some kind of social identity with their mentees. Mm. So if you can share being a man or share being a woman, you're more likely to be mentored if you can't share either one of those things. So a practice that says, look, we know mentorship is good, but we know it also doesn't equally extend across our entire workforce, that's a moment for intersectional intervention. Those are the kinds of moments that you can make a difference by being aware of the different situation of some of your workforce. Thank you. So now we're going to make a hard left just a little bit. And because we're in Texas and there was some policy changes that took place, was it yesterday, around uh, the transgender bathroom policy, I wanted us to, to gently talk about that. And uh, EJ, I'll start with you, but anybody else who wants to hop in on it. Um, so last May, the Department of Education and Justice issued joint guidance directing schools to let transgender students use facilities that correspond with their gender identity. Based on the Obama administration's interpretation of Title IX, the federal law that prohibits sex discrimination in schools to include gender identity, Trump's administrations rescinded this guidance yesterday without offering a replacement. Supporters of this say that it's not anti-LGBTQ sentiments, but federal overreach into state matters, and that schools should be able to determine this policy at the local level. I'm curious about what would be your recommendations, not just to schools, but any organization, because I think including our organization is grappling with this type of policy. Um, well, I actually was just um, <clears throat> reminded of a story um, when I was in high school, and I remember that we had um, our LGBT club um, fought for um, having more um, gender neutral bathrooms, you know, in the school. And I, I even remember, you know, talking to my friends and be like, well, who cares? I mean, like, you know, you have your men, you have your women's and you can go to the bathroom. And now here I am, you know, being me and doing me and, you know, realize, okay, like, so today if my outfit requires a skirt, where do I go? You know, where am I comfortable? I don't have a problem peeing in the men's bathroom, you know, in my you know, whatever outfit I'm in, but some people do. A lot of people do. So I just, you know, don't understand why we wouldn't have more of those, you know, bathrooms where people can be comfortable or at least have those conversations or an open environment where we can at least talk about it. And I think that, you know, in 
whether in schools or in offices, I mean, like, those are the types of places that we need to be having these conversations about what's making you know our community comfortable, especially when it's time to go to the bathroom because everybody has to go to the bathroom. And so, you know, in a school, why are you why do you want to put, you know, some a gender fluid child or you know someone who do, doesn't quite know what they're doing, but you know they're doing them. They don't know where they fit in yet. In a situation where, you know, they could get beat up. Or mm -hmm. ultimately killed. You mm -hmm. never know what's going down. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in in rough neighborhoods when, where you know people are you know less educated. They you know they don't want to. They don't know what's going on. They're very quick to judge, and they're you know, they're very quick to act on you know those impulses just because they see someone you know being different. And you know, I always you know I continue to think that I'm just like, why would you want to put subject somebody to that type of unnecessary violence? Mm -hmm. You know, and. Um, and I'm also grateful that you know we're at least having these conversations because you know four years ago we really weren't. You know, I was just talking to you earlier about you know like we're you know the trans community is having a revolution right now, which is great. You know, we weren't really talking about it before you know Caitlyn Jenner, but you know it's a blessing and it's a curse. You know because that's just you know it opens the door to have the conversation, but it also lets in a different type of you know discrimination, a different type of ignorance. So I think that we were making, you know, steps, you know, in the right direction when it comes to, you know, having those bathrooms. And now that we're taking them away, and now we have to think, you know, we have to, the states and the cities have to think about, okay, like, is this important or not? I'm like, why are we taking that step back when we just made, you know, a great stride forward? I think to your point about how do you resist any type of policy, um, including uh, bathroom policies, and this is really the moment that you think about what resistance actually looks like, right? And when you start taking matters in your own hand, this is our country, right? These are our schools. Our taxpayer dollars pay for, you know, the, the our college campuses. When I think about, you know, policies like sanctuary campuses or sanctuary, you know, workplaces or you know, any any anything that this administration is trying to implement moving forward is that. The question is, what are you willing to do, right? You know, like, is the principal going to find that resistance, you know, in her or him? You know, is the corporate, you know, CEO going to say, you know, not on my watch, you know, not, not in my, you know, not in my company, you know, what, whatever that I issue uh, is that's going to be impacted. And I always tell people, you know, people will say, you know, but now it's the law. It's not the, you know, whatever, you know, this is just how it is. And I always tell people, like, that, that offends me when people say that, because I'm like, oh, so what you're saying is if you lived at the time of slavery, you would be cool with slavery, because slavery mm -hmm. was law. If you lived at the time of segregation, you were cool with segregation of races because, you know, it was the law. So this idea that the, in this country we talk a lot in this particular administration, which is already showing early signs of war, fascism, which is this obsession with law and order, right, with obsession with, like, national security, uh, you know, disdain for intellectuals and the arts, like, you, you know, rampant sexism, like all the things that we're seeing from this administration are clearly fascism. If you ever went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., there's a sign that I didn't write that says early warning signs of fascism. And literally all these things I just listed are word for word. I, I like memorize them. So I think that the, in this moment that we are in, and we haven't really been in it, at least in my lifetime. I mean, I know obviously there has been many moments of resistance in the past. But in my lifetime, I'm 36 years old, I haven't seen a moment, and I haven't yet even seen it in the way I want to see it. This is the time to be like, I don't give a damn what policies come from the top. I'm ready to protect the people that are in my communities. I'm ready to protect the students that come to my schools. I'm going to protect you know, those who come to my church or my synagogue or my mosque. You know, that this idea that we have given up so much power to the law and to the government that we don't understand the power that we have. And that we have to be willing to say, Okay, you want to come to my church and take undocumented people? You got to get through me first. You know, you want to come to, you know, uh, you know, even with the and we were talking about this, even with the, um, you know, potential stop and frisk like national law. Like we la we literally have a Blue Lives Matter administration, and notice this, notice that it's been like a few weeks where we haven't really had the the trending hashtags about the black woman or black man that has been killed by the police. Right? Does that mean it's not happening? It's that we're so damn distracted by the, the, the outrageousness that is coming out of this administration, stuff that I think we could resist against, that we forgot the issues we were already working on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? yeah. yeah. So where I want to go with this is we have a few minutes left before the Q&A is 
what you just said there is getting to a position of realizing the power that I actually have, shifting my frame in terms of my relationship to it instead of encourage. What I kind of felt kind of ease up my back when you were talking through that is people being like, I'm, I don't really know if, I'm, if I have that much courage. I don't even know if I can walk in that place. So I'm wondering, like final words from everybody up here, um, keeping it like 20 seconds or less, just thinking about how- I have more than 20 how seconds. How does one, you have more? Because well, <laughs> I was I know, taking I notes, know, I'm a journalist. We, we get there? Okay, um, sorry, I was taking notes. I wasn't texting, I, I swear. <laughs> um, Okay, so a couple things. How do we get there? Um, one of the things that I think is critical, we, we touched on this a little bit here and there, but I really wanna drive this home. Um, you have to take personal responsibility for understanding the way this country works, the way this country was founded, the way systems work and institutions work. It's, okay, it's my job. Right, literally my job to explain these systems of inequity, racism, and how it gets played out in America. That is literally what I am paid to do. And I love it, and I will continue to do it as long as I can. I recently got an email from someone, I wrote um, a story about, what about, call, the headline was, what, what about the black working class? Because the narrative we heard during the campaign was, white working class, white working class, white working class, white working class, right? Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? Okay, well, we left out a whole segment of the population, and this is critical, okay? We are in a moment right now of absolutely necessary media literacy. You must understand the narratives that are being told. You have to take responsibility and learn about as much as you can and then begin to ask the questions. So my story about the black working class comes out, and I get an email from a reader who says, look, I'm white, um, I'm married, uh, live in the Midwest, my wife and I, you know, were screwed by the recession. You know, how do you explain what you're trying to say in this piece and how did that affect me? And I said, great, you want data? Data you'll, you shall have. And I took 20, 30 minutes out of my day and crafted an email to him, very long email explaining point by point that this wasn't about the fact that whites weren't affected by the housing crisis or the great recession. The fact of the matter is, if you understand wealth inequity in America, there is a racial wealth gap where whites continue to have 13 times the wealth of blacks and Latinos. I'm gonna put that in actual figures for you. $140,000 is the average wealth for a white family, $11,000 for black families, and $13,000 for Latinos. The math has been done. These are not typos, okay? You need to understand and take responsibility for learning about how we got here and why we got here. That's my job, and I'm happy to answer those questions. But we, we're at a point right now where we can no longer say, I, I have no yeah. idea what's yeah. happening. I really yeah. don't know. Because you know what? It's not acceptable. The other thing I will say that you can't put the burden on, on marginalized communities to always explain and do the work for you, right? right. And there right. was a, right. a book called This Bridge Called My Back. That, yeah. that analogy right there, Think about that for a minute. That's really, you know, I think the point. Thank you. I agree with everything you just said. That was that was everything. Um, but just a little more, I guess, on um, on the burden not being on our back. But um, I think that that's you know a great point. At the same time, I think um, you know just without race, I think when it comes to gender and sexuality, just because it's such a gray area, sometimes we do have to explain a little more. And like I, for instance, like, you know, do get it annoyed, like, well, why doesn't this person know, figure out what's going on in my life? But I set my rules. I set my standards. I know what to call myself. You don't. But instead of assuming what you think I'd like to be called, you can just ask, and I'll let you know. <laughs> so I think like in that conversation, you might have to explain yourself a little bit more. And that's okay. Don't get annoyed. You know, it's not them being annoying or ignorant. They're just trying to figure out what's going on. And, you know, we have to take that part to just explain a little more until we get to a place we don't have to have these conversations because everyone's just doing what they gotta be doing. I'm just gonna say just be uncomfortable. And that being uncomfortable is okay. Yeah. All right, time for Q&A. I'm curious um, on your point of view as for um, the pro-life community not being invited to the march. I'd just like to hear a little bit about that, if you could talk a little bit about that. So that was another manifested controversy. So an educational mo moment for everyone. 
This was a pro-choice march. So let's say that again. This was a pro-choice march. That means that you give women the agency to choose for themselves whether or not they want to get an abortion or whether or not they want to keep a baby. So what we were very clear about from day one is that this was a pro-choice march. So regardless of what your personal opinion is about that, you were welcome to the march. What we were not going to do is we were not going to allow specific anti-choice groups, right? So the, the, the difference between being whoever you are and specifically being against the woman's right to choose for her body, because that take that is all types of problematic. So this was a march that brought people. There were people there who were pro-life. So as long as you don't take my right or want to work against my right to choose for my own body. So that's, that was the kind of context in which we organized the Women's March. How do we balance pushing the conversation deeper but also keeping a door open for those who are just now opening their eyes and may feel threatened, quote unquote, by talking about intersectionality? We have a I think it goes back to the point that I was making. I don't think anyone has to walk out of the room saying they too are critical race scholars, right? Like no one's expecting that um, after this chat. But I do think it's a, it's a question of curiosity and openness to hearing and being uncomfortable and asking the uncomfortable question. I'm surprised that there's only one question in the room. I know there's probably a lot of questions in people's minds right now, right? Thinking, should I, shouldn't I? It's okay to ask it. Like, I have these conversations in the newsroom all the time. I say, I'd rather us have the uncomfortable conversation now, behind the scenes, when we're just like trying to figure out this story or this video, than broadcast something that's inaccurate, okay? Um, I, I want to embrace the idea of discomfort that has been um, put on the table and, and normalize discomfort and denormalize comfort with injustice. That, that's the real shift right now. Um, and it, I mean, we could just sort of take an example of wherever, whatever space we're in. I, I, I teach at two law schools many times I am the only person that looks like me in the room that I'm in. Um, never am I in a room where there's anywhere close to parity between people who look like me and the rest of the population. I think we're also sitting in a room where, if we were honest, we would look around and say, there's a certain lack of parity between the way this space is constituted and the world outside. It's not unique to Google. It's it's, it's everywhere, mm -hmm. and it's on every part of it. If you go to a, a family court, um, or if you go to a, a benefits shelter, that place doesn't look like the rest of America. So when we live in a society when it's still predictable by just looking at someone, whether they're likely to be the CEO or the person who cleans, we still have a hierarchy that's racially coded. This is called decoding race, right? Yeah. You're not going to be able to decode it if you don't notice something needs to be decoded, right? It's not something out there. It's something everywhere we happen to be. So the question is, what kind of orientation do we want to have as we begin the process of decoding? Why do we want to decode? What are the questions that we want to ask? I would say that some questions that we might want to ask are, what are the societal processes, the dynamics that create the space that we're in? How did it happen? And, and what story are we telling ourselves if we're not asking that question? Because you've got to have a story about why your space looks the way it is. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a story about why your neighborhood is made up the way it is. You've got to have a story about why your church looks the way. You've got to have a story. You might not be telling yourself what it is, but you have a story. And many times that story is deeply problematic. It's often a story about, well, people are just choosing different things. Or people just have different talents. Or they have different cultural habits. They have the ability to withstand instant gratification is a story. I mean, there are all sorts of stories that we tell ourselves about how our institutions look the way they do. And when we don't challenge those stories, we reproduce those systems. Because we tend to reproduce the same thing that got us there. Mm -hmm. When you're asking, what should the next um, CEO look like? Or what should be a qualification for doing X job? 
you're likely to base the answer on what the system has already produced. But what that system has produced didn't come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that just got constituted without race and, and without gender playing a role. So by, by saying discomfort, I mean being uncomfortable not asking those questions, being uncomfortable just going along like it's all OK, being brave enough to say, it's up to us to decide how much of this we can produce differently, how we can be creative about how we conceptualize um, what a good candidate is, to be creative enough to think about how this job could be do done differently, to be bold enough to say we're not satisfied with our society looking the way it does or this institution looking the way it does. It's those kind of discomforts that I think we should want to create and we should want to be uncomfortable with not doing that. Mm -hmm. Deep inquiry and reflection. Other questions? Um, so if I think about one of the many policies that bother me about the new administration is the education school choice and how that's gonna impact women of color in particular. So just wanna hear your thoughts on what we can do, what you think that impact could be, and how we can change that trajectory possibly. Well, I'll start with just a couple observations. I'm sure everyone has some thoughts about this. Um, so I'm gonna say a word that gets talked about a lot, but um, isn't often defined. We're in a neoliberal moment. Um, by that, I'm trying to uh, capture the idea that um, everything is being reduced to markets. And in that, most things are being privatized, which includes public education. So the moves that we're going to be seeing in public education and um, in health and in pretty much everything else are moves to greater and greater privatization. With greater privatization, typically has become greater levels of inequality, greater levels of hierarchy, greater levels of people of color, particularly not being able to make it to the top. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we can more or less predict the areas that will be more likely um, impactful on communities of color are those areas where people of color actually had a greater role in the public production of the, of the good. Education is one of them. Government in general is another one. Why is it that people of color actually are more in government than other places? Well, let's start, let's start asking those questions. I think there are clear answers to that, and consequently, there are clear answers to the outcome. I'll, I'll say this as just a, a last point, because I think the tendency when people hear why are certain institutions looking the way they do, including the government, which is far more integrated than private space, there's a sense that that's the product of discrimination that happened a long time ago. I don't think there's a sense that there are things happening right here and right now. They might not look like the kind of things that we are used to before. There aren't white-only signs. People aren't picketing. They're not throwing bricks at Martin Luther King. But there are other ways in which pipelines are racially constructed so that, yes, more people are in public education than private. Yes, more people are in certain jobs than others. And then here's the last thing. Yes, more people have wealth than others. So Tanzino is talking about the wealth gap. Let me add this last piece. Um, women of color have a median net worth, Latinas and, and black women, of zero dollars. I just want you to think about what that means. Mo close to a majority of women of color don't have the amount of wealth that it takes to buy a Big Mac. I mean, wealth is what you have after all of your deficits, all, all your debts are uh, subtracted from your assets. Wealth is what allows you to provide for your children. Wealth is what allows you to take care of a sick parent and also send your kid to summer camp. Wealth is what allows you to move to a place where you can have access to healthy food or you can have access to recreation. Wealth is the thing that allows you to actually sustain yourself during the kind of crises that, are all, that will always be happening in a, an economy like ours. When we can say that one part of our population has a median net wealth of zero, it's telling you that the pipelines that their children will be in are not going to lead to places like this, right? Hmm. So it's going all the way back to the baselines. 
who has what in the society. And that's not natural. So maybe you know, maybe you don't. At a time when the government played the biggest role in creating the, the neighborhoods we have was in the federal housing, um, the creation of federal housing. They spent $120 billion, these are in 1940s dollars, to create suburbs. These suburbs were created as all white enclaves by the government. So what does it mean to have bought a house in the suburbs in 1940 for, let's say, $25,000 versus being forced to live in a ghetto for about the same amount in, in terms of your monthly housing costs? That, that gave you a difference between having a house back then and an apartment. But now, three generations later, the one who bought the house, what are they able to do with that equity? They can send kids to college. They can send kids to graduate school. You can go around the world if you want to. The family that had to settle for the apartment in a ghetto probably still is living in an apartment in a ghetto. We'll look at that and say, well, those are just natural you know, realities. They are the product of public policy. So the point is, if public policy can create racialized class, then it can uncreate it. We just have to be willing to see that these are the products of public policy. That's the challenge that I'm trying to encourage everybody to do. And I, I want you to think on an individual level, too. Yeah, please. I mentioned before I grew up in public housing. I also went to public school. Um, I have a master's degree. I have an undergraduate degree. Um, and those are all from public school. And why? Is that the case? Because it was a financial decision. And you wouldn't think that because of where I work and, like I said, the big fancy job and I hope you like my outfit, you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, growing up in that environment without having that equity to pass on, it doesn't only afford you those opportunities, it means I can't take a break. It's very hard to take a break. I want you guys to understand when you're looking at resumes, because this comes up a lot, especially when you're thinking, we gotta hire brown people, right? We gotta hire these brown people, so you look into all the brown people that work in your department, and you're like, they've gotta know somebody, right? And then you get all the resumes in, and then the first thing you do, and I know y'all do this, is look for what? Harvard. Stanford, yada, yada, we're gonna go on and on, right? But do you look at State University? Uh-uh, that's out, that's in the circular file immediately, right? You're right there, you're eliminating a talent pool um, that you haven't even considered, right? And there's nothing wrong with Harvard and Stanford and Columbia and all these wonderful places, you know? I'll be, you know, potentially teaching at some of those places in my future. So, so the fact of the matter is these are amazing institutions, but we cannot continue to assume especially when you're looking for talent of color, you're only looking for the unicorn, right? The unicorns are amazing, but unicorns live in many different parts of this, this population. I guarantee you that you get somebody who's worked so hard to get there, and so to them, getting a, a job at Google or at the New York Times or one of these places is like, I mean, it's unthinkable, right? It's, it's, you're, you're creating a pathway to prosperity. You're creating a change in someone's class you know, level potentially. And that's not to say that it's magic and all of a sudden, because I have that, that fancy job and I'm not, you know, I'm not, my net worth isn't like, you know, believe me, I'm still shopping discount. But the point is that that matters. And you all, again, bringing it back to yourselves, really take a look at when you're examining people, because that's a big part of, I think, where we tend to block a black person or Latino person, but only if they went to da 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 place. It eliminates too many people. It seems like the media is attending to whatever's the most important to the most people at that time, which leads to a very reactionary type of you know, response from everyone. Um, how do we avoid that? How do we be more proactive and avoid this sort of firefighting mentality where we're only attacking the issues that Twitter cares about? Thank you for that question. Um, I'm assuming you wanted me to answer it as a member of the media, um, the mainstream media. Woo. All right. Um, I tell people, I was just on a panel a week ago um, about uh, for this talk on race and policing, and the similar question was raised. And I said, you as media consumers have a tremendous amount of power, OK? Um, I'll give you the example. At the New York Times, I created the race beat in 2013. 
Um, I said, you know, went to the then executive editor, Jill Abramson, and said, look, I've got this idea. I think these stories are doing well. This is pre-Ferguson, just so we have a timeline, right? Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, this is a great idea. Let's do it. I said, great. Um, went from, you know, doing what I was doing on the media desk to covering this beat. And I think I was the first Latina to, to found a beat like that, right, at the Times. Not to say the Times hadn't covered race in the past. It had, but it had been about 13 years since they did it systemically. Um, and so I was suggesting that we sit down and have me do it and kick it off and, you know, and that I think went very well. We had a lot of great stories. Um, you can look them up yourselves. You know, looked, I covered everything from black women and, and discipline in schools to Asian American elder care issues to how Arab Americans and Latino Americans are answering the census form, like who's white, who's not. I mean, you know, we sort of went all over and these stories got really good responses. Um, after about a year, the Times decided, we don't need this beat, you know, for whatever reason, and we're killing it. What they didn't, what they didn't realize, what, and what I told them was, this isn't going to sit well with our audience. Well, guess what? It didn't. Um, the audience went to, took to Twitter, took to, we had a public editor at the Times, an ombudsman at the Times, it was, um, at that time it was Margaret Sullivan, who's now at the Washington Post. And just email, you know, just people were just like, done. Like, they were like, what are you talking about, right? And it just became this, like, huge, huge issue where the public editor called and said, look, I've got to cover this for the time. So that's not awkward, right? I'm working at the company, but now I'm going to be the subject of an internal, you know, public, uh, not a review, but really it's essentially an answer to our public, right? That's what the ombudsman is for, to say, wait, everybody's upset. Let's, let's interview and hold this institution to the, the, the institution's feet to the fire. At the center of that, totally cool, not a problem, right? Um, it was very difficult to see that, but it was also really heartening to show that, wow, you know, we get results, right? Your readers can get results. It was covered in Columbia Journalism Review, NPR, um, you know, your National Review, I mean, all these places, uh, I'm sorry, the New Republic, not National Review, that would have been a whole other story. Yeah. Um, so we got a lot of coverage, you know, about this issue. And I wasn't being interviewed. It was just about the issue, you know, at large. So long story short, they brought it back. I left, but they brought it back. Um, and now they're attempting in their own way to try and cover, you know, race in, in America. I wish them the best. Um, but I look at that as an, an opportunity, and it was really interesting to see the audience say, wait a minute, this is not what we want. So you guys have a tremendous amount of power. Um, you also are inundated with media left and right from every corner of the world at this point. I mean, I have to put, I'm considering taking Twitter off my phone because I just can't. It, it, and, I, and I have to do this for a living, right? Um, you have to pay attention to the people who are writing the content or, or shooting the content or making the content that you want to see and support that content, whether it means subscribing, watching, clicking, emailing, you know, sending a letter to the editor, whatever it is, because Ultimately, that's how you change the narrative, right? That's the work I'm trying to do. It was shut down at one place, so I brought it someplace else and said, all right, maybe it won't be shut down here. But I'm just one of, you know, X thousands and thousands of voices out there. So, you know, I try to do my part and elevate my stories and signal boost my stories to get out there and try to tell these narratives that aren't getting told. And there are many other people that are trying to do the same, but they need to be supported. So I think sometimes we're asked to do either or, and I think we do kind of still have to be prepared to do rapid response and crisis. Like, people always say to me, why are you always outraged when like black people are killed by the police? Like, that's just how it is. And I say to people, look, it is how it is, right? It's been how it is, but I wanna be outraged. Like, don't take my humanity away from me and tell me that I shouldn't be outraged every time a black person's killed at the hands of law enforcement. So what Twitter has done, it has its benefits in that it allows me sitting in Brooklyn, New York, to figure out that there's a young man in, named Mike Brown in Ferguson that just got shot by a police officer. It allows me to be connected to those very human stories that if we as society don't elevate, ain't nobody care about Mike Brown, nobody cares about Sandra Bland. So it really is props to the young people who figured out to take a public platform to basically be able to say, you will not ignore our pain. You will not ignore the blood on the streets in our community. So there is that opportunity to, yes, be able to say, yeah, maybe you know Sandra Bland was a trending hashtag, 
praise the Lord that it was because I would have never learned her story. I would have never been able to say her name. But to, to, to the other parallel that we could do, because I wanna, oh, I'm always in crisis response. Like I'm always ready to do ra rapid response. But I also understand the importance of building longevity and building sustainability in our communities, right? So while we're not organizing for Sandra Bland, how are we preventing another black woman from getting shot by a police officer or being killed in a cell, you know, in custody of, 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 of our state, basically. And I think what we often do is we get, and this is, this is why I always say to people, ain't no time for part-time progressives, ain't no time for part-time activists. You either come in here to invest your time or you get out of our way because I don't wanna see you, right, at that protest that one time. I'm not saying that that's not beneficial to show up, but I wanna know where you are tomorrow. And the day after that, because when you leave here, there's still someone else that's impacted. That person had not, has not come back to life. And oftentimes, those very people that we protest for still don't get justice. Everybody, you can name any trending hashtag in the past year and a half, not one of those people got justice. So we didn't even win those smaller fights. So being able to organize, being able to give resources to the very local organizations on the ground in places like Ferguson, right? Being able to say, okay, who's in Texas organizing around Sandra Bland? What kind of resources do those people need? How can I, as a Googler, be able to provide, maybe I can't do it in my official capacity, but I may be an engineer. I may know how to build a website for them. I may know how to help them fil fix their algorithm so that whatever story they got is going out even farther. We all got something to give to the movement. So my, for me, it's like, yes, show up. Yes, be outraged. It's okay that there's a trending hashtag. The question is, what are you offering so that next time, God forbid, there is to be something that happens in that community, they got more resources than they had six months ago when another person went down in their, in their community. So I think for, 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 for me, it's like we could stay rapid response and crisis response. And we, by the way, are going to have to do a lot of that under this administration. Just letting you all know, get ready. I'm already tired. It's only been in like five weeks. But, <laughs> but, but really understanding like, Communities of color, we just are always like, oh man, we're just being hit from every way and we never just get the time to be like, we would like to reflect and have a retreat <laughs> and figure out how to do asset mapping and what we need. And we try that, we attempt it. The minute we leave that retreat on Monday, someone else is shot in our community, a family's about to be deported, a mosque is vandalized, this one gets, the, we just are always like distracted. So the question for us is how do we build sustainability and then how do our white allies who aren't easily distracted because they don't have the same priorities or are they're not as directly impacted as we are, and which was why the Women's March on Washington was as successful as it is. And I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of the people that did the, so for example, graphic designer was like, we coming in, we're gonna do your, your, your branding. I didn't have to, I, don't, I was like, just, I would have just slapped up anything, I don't even care, right? The website the social media, right? People who are like, we got you, you do the work, you set the policy agenda, you do the outreach, you call the partners, you do what you're good at. We'll do all that other technological, whatever, and a lot of these people do work at tech firms, and that's why we had such a big apparatus, and people were like, where did they get those resources from? It was, it cost us zero. It was people who owned tech firms and said, this is what we wanna do, this is what we wanna offer the movement, and by the way, those same people didn't bounce on January 21st. Those people are still, maintaining the infrastructure, hosting our websites, making sure that our stuff is maintained, that it's still up to date. So help, think about being able to say it's okay to be in rapid response and crisis response, but how do we think about longevity, sustainability, and building a movement that, is, that, that lives outside of us and lives beyond every individual case of outrage that we are in almost on the daily? All right, so thank, let's thank our panelists first. And, and because this is Google, I know uh, like some takeaways I just want to land with. I tried to summarize kind of some of the points that you all laid out, and I think you're wondering what can I walk out of here with. I think the first piece of advice is the current status quo that we have right now to not see it as normal. So if you're working in staffing, if you're working in any type of organization where you're taking a look at diversity, if you're taking a look at whether or not this place is inclus inclusive, that the way things exist right now is something that was created and it was created by the people in the room, in the office. It's not some external arm that's like, or some force outside of us is being created. So I think Dr. Crenshaw invited us to say, let's look at what's here, what we see as normal as our day to day. And, and it's not something that's normal. It's not something that's out of my hands. And so engaging that deep inquiry process of how is this created now 
out and, and then thinking about what is my responsibility, I think was said a few times up here. Um, the second thing is developing awareness of our own personal power. So this sense that this is too big for me to handle. I think we have great examples of people who all engage in the work, put their talent and their creative creativity combined together to begin to disrupt things. Great examples of that happening here. And there's, you're human, just as they're human, right? And what they can do, you can do. Um, the third thing is actually, instead of asking the question of what about me, when someone starts centering their experience, to ask the question of what can I offer? And really asking the question of who around me is encountering multiple forms of violence, multiple forms of disadvantage. And it doesn't matter what your identity is, but actually think about that particularly when we're centering an issue that makes you personally uncomfortable. I just want to drive that point home. If it makes you uncomfortable, it's probably the issue we need to be talking about. All right? Um, and then finally, I love this, this last talk about infrastructure. So I know that people are trying to figure out, given what their roles are, particularly if they're technical in nature, or they don't see the direct connection to it, really thinking about what's my talent, what's my gift, what's my skill, and how can I lend it to whatever the causes the issue is. And notice, she didn't describe somebody going there and asking for it. She described people who offered. And so really be thinking about how do I step up in offering my talent and gifts to this position. All right, thank you all for your time. Thank you for your attention.